the official recommendation is to stop eating fat and cholesterol. And that is what like changed everything. And, and we know it's fraud. We know this guy was paid off. This was bought and paid for fraud and funded yeah. by the sugar companies. They, they didn't disclose any of that. They didn't disclose that they, he was on the payroll, didn't disclose that this was being funded by the sugar companies, didn't disclose any of that. It was absolute bullshit. We were talking about this before for now, but I wanted to pick your brain about what you know about, let's see, I have a list here of the, the questions, but you know, the things that we have been told and what you know about them, like mm. cholesterol, for example, if you know how and why that became like mm. a demon mm. and like, I guess just like a, you know, quick some is it summarization like a minute of what that was or something if you have a minute, two minutes i don't know how long that takes Ooh, all right we'll see but i'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll try to be quick but yeah like there's 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 clear documented uh evidence of what happened uh, on that so yeah. yeah yeah that one's that one's a, that one's just pure fraud you know and, and and published in major medical journals you know recently you know the actual internal memos from sugar companies talking about all the people they bought off and how much they paid them and and things like that and and so, you know, and all the different studies that, that they paid them off to doctor and, and uh, things like that. So who's, who's they, who was paying? Sh the Sugar Foundation, it's called the Sugar, Sugar Research Foundation and uh, mm -hmm. just, just sugar wow. industry. And so uh, now it's called the Sugar Association. And yeah. The, that's like not even real. That's like out of a, that's like out of a comic book or something. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just some, some, some evil, you know, group you know, just trying to, to manipulate yeah, things and manipulate markets. And, uh, yeah, they, they, that was published in the journal American of the American medical association in 2016, their actual internal memos showing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and, and publish these fraudulent studies and make it look like cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar. Uh, and there's a bunch of other professors as well. They, they, that, like, like Ansel Keys is a famous guy that was yeah. in that crusade against, uh, cholesterol. Um, and even, and even you would say things like, well, you know, you know, well, you know, even if, if cholesterol doesn't cause harm, you know, it might, so, you know, might as well just replace it. And, and the argument was from the beginning was, well, you need these calories, right? And most people were getting their calories from fat if they could. And so I said, well, you have to replace these calories with something. So, you know, why not sugar? You know, it's just, it's just an empty calorie. It'll just go in there. It's fine. It's safe. And so, you know, maybe cholesterol causes heart disease, maybe it doesn't, but you know, if you just don't eat it, you don't need it, you don't have to have it and you just replace it with sugar, it's safe and, uh, and, and you, you might be avoiding a heart attack. That was the argument. In fact, you know, it made things way, way worse because like sugar absolutely can cause yeah. heart disease and diabetes and all these other sorts of things. And Insane. yeah, no, he was an absolute piece of shit. And uh, one of those... Yeah professors, uh, Harvard professors was actually named head of the USDA and, and he actually authored and published, um, in 1977, a USDA declaration saying that, you know, the official, the official, uh, line is that cholesterol causes heart disease, saturated fat increases cholesterol. Everyone should, the recommendation, the official recommendation is to stop eating fat and cholesterol. And that is what like changed everything. And, and we know it's fraud. We know this guy was paid off. He was actually paid. Uh, we have these contracts. He was paid $6,500 to do that. Right. $6,500. Yeah. I guess back then, what would that have been? I don't know. 50 grand. 50? 50. That's grand. nothing. Dude, he bought that's a Camry. Terrible. You know, I mean, like that, that's what this like life was worth to him and his, his integrity and, and the health of the, of humanity, you know, wow. the, you know, and they also funded a lot of this research without saying anything. <laughs> so they never, they never disclosed that, that the sugar, that this was all industry research. They thought this was, this was like independent research coming from a top Harvard professor and researcher like, wow, couldn't get more legit. And no, this was, this was, this was bought and paid for fraud and funded yeah. by the sugar companies. They, they didn't disclose any of that. They didn't disclose that they, he was on the payroll, didn't disclose that this was being funded by the sugar companies, didn't disclose any of that. Um, it was absolute bullshit. And, <laughs> Did uh, you say he went and bought a Camry? Yeah, I mean, like what, what are you gonna do? 50 grand, man, I mean, that, that that's yeah. it. You know, that's what your soul was worth. And, yeah, um, that's terrible. You know, and, then, and they buried a lot of other things too. I mean, there've been, there were randomized controlled trials um, you know, trading out, trading out saturated fat with uh, like unsaturated fats, 
uh, like Ansel Keys would do some of these things. Some of these guys would do these things. And, uh, and you know, they didn't show any improvement. They didn't show any improvement on cardiovascular disease or, um, you know, heart attacks and everything like that. And in fact, some of them found worse, a worsening situation. And these are big studies. These are, these are randomized control trials with thousands to even tens of thousands of people, right? It's the high, you know, level one evidence. And, um, and they buried it because it showed that, you know, that it showed the opposite of what they were trying to prove. And so they, like one of them can only came out like a, in, within the last decade and it was done in like the sixties. Another one that Ansel Keys did, I think it was the, the Minnesota coronary heart study or something like that. Um, they buried that for like 20 years. And then when it came out and they were like, they, people went back and was like, well, why, why, why'd you bury this? Like, why didn't you do it? Was it, was it not a good study? Was there flaws? And they, you know, they, they admitted, they were like, well, no, no, there's nothing wrong with the study itself. It's just that, you know, we just, we were pretty disappointed with the outcome. You know, I was like, Oh my God, you don't get to yeah. fucking do that. But, That's wild. But industry research does that every day. Right. You know, that, yeah. that's why, you know, if the only thing you can say about industry funded research is that it's going to reflect the company position almost invariably. And the reason is because they'll doctor shit to make it look uh, a certain way. And if it doesn't come out in the way that they like, uh, they just bury it. They just won't publish it. So anything that gets right. published is something that, that gave a favorable outcome. That doesn't mean that, that those are the only studies done. In fact, there are a lot of them that, that didn't get uh, published tons and tons. I mean, we have no idea how many because they don't, don't get published. But, you know, like with probiotics, it came out recently that probiotics, taking probiotics is actually not necessarily good for you. It might actually. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a large study that was done years ago that actually showed that they were bad for you. Um, but it was industry funded. And so they buried it. It was actually done here in Perth. I talked to, I talked to the doctor, the gastroenterologist who actually ran the trial and ran the study. And he was saying that, you know, the, the different this probiotic companies couldn't say who had, like I said, it was like, you know, like six people, like, oh, this shows a little benefit. So it's clinically proven to show benefit, right? Six people. Yeah. That, that's what it's proven. Of. Six. Right. What was the total? What was the number out of how many? Out of how many? Sorry. No, no, no. Six people out of how many? Oh, only six people in the trial. That was it. Oh, so, in the entire trial? So, so this is like, <laughs> they, they, they say this is a, a trial. So clinically proven. Like, so oh worse. my God, it was just six people. They don't tell you what the actual oh. trial is. And like, um, or something, right? six <laughs> people. And so then they, they said, okay, well, let's get a bigger trial. Let's fund a bigger trial and, uh, and get some, I mean, you know, they were, they were, they wanted to, to show their, you know, back up their product. But great. I mean, I'm all for that. But it actually showed the opposite. They had a large trial actually showed that it's actually, you know, making people worse, making their health worse. And so they were like, and they were getting ready to publish it. And they got a letter from the, the company. It just said, if you publish that, we'll sue you. And so mm -hmm. they had to bury it. And um, so the abstract is available, but no, actually, the, but the study like would ne never saw the light of day. And that's how it works. That's how it works in industry research, you know? And so, you know, they didn't yeah. tell anyone that that, that Minnesota trial was, uh, was industry funded research. You know, they thought, oh, this is independent. Oh, why didn't you publish it? Because it was paid for by the sugar companies and they didn't fucking want it published. That's why. And it's, it was literally called the Sugar Foundation, right? Uh, yeah, it was like the Sugar Research Foundation back then. Now it's called the Sugar, sugar. Association. Yeah. Okay, I that's right. Them. Sugar Association. That's that's, that's literally out of a, like a comic book. Like it's yeah. just, just like can't even. So was it the same now? Like talking about from okay cholesterol, right? Basically, what you're saying is the Sugar Association mm -hmm. paid off the three Harvard researchers mm -hmm. professors to essentially recommend that people. Mm -hmm. lower their cholesterol mm -hmm. and that that's a, that's a factor instead of sugar. And so, yeah. and that sugar might be the issue. So what about fat? Is it the same thing? Yeah. So, so they, they said that saturated fat increases cholesterol. Therefore right. saturated fat is bad. So stop eating all of those things. Yeah. And that was all in that same, that was all tied together. All tied together. Yeah. So they, Interesting. there were, there was research coming out huh. sort of in the, in the sort of the fifties when, when heart disease, heart disease wasn't really, no, no one really knew what was going on with heart disease. It really only started rising in prevalence to any significant degree, like in the 20th century. And so it wasn't until uh, President Eisenhower had a heart attack that that started making national attention and, and people started 
saying like, okay, well, what, what the hell is this? It wasn't, it wasn't something that we really knew about. And so it got a lot of media attention. And so it got a lot of press. And, and then so people started looking into it and looking into it more. And there was, there were initial studies looking at, looking at um, sugar and how it was directly correlated um, with, with heart disease, with the rise of heart disease in, in every country that was studied. So, you know, uh, as you know, people started eating more refined sugars and having more sugar in their, in their diet, heart disease rose like, you know, 10, 15 years later, it just started going up and it was just perfectly tracked in a delayed fashion as you would expect with, with a disease that takes, you know, years to develop. And so we were like, okay, you know, well, this is, this is what that's looking like. And, uh, the sugar companies, you know, just were like, yeah, well, we need to put out opposition research. They're still doing that now, you know, anytime something comes out that shows that their product like sugar or something else is uh, not good for you. They, they just fund a whole bunch of research to show that, Oh, well, maybe it not, might not be all that bad. And then you just go, wow. I mean, the, the jury's not not out, you know, the jury's out, you know? So it's like, oh, yeah. you know, it's just like, well, we've got 30 studies to say it's bad, 30 studies to say it's okay. So I oh, just need, you just need to look at this more. So, you know, and then people will cherry pick and just say like, oh, well, look at this study and it says it's okay. Look at this canola oil and it's not all that bad or cottonseed oil. It's not all that bad. Okay, fine. But there are a ton of others that, that show that it causes you know clear harm. And uh, I mean, seed oils is, is a bit of an insanity to me because first of yeah, all, it never existed more than a hundred years ago. So how are we saying this is an essential thing for us to eat? It didn't exist. Can, nothing can be essential to, to yeah. human existence if it didn't exist for, you know, since the beginning. Right. And, um, in the 1970s, they actually used to use seed oils as immunosuppressants for transplant patients. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a kidney transplant, you have to, you have to stuff down your immune system so much that it doesn't attack this foreign body. Right. They were using seed oils to do that. I mean, you don't have to make too, you know, much progress in your logic to realize that that's, that's going to have that effect on other people as well, you know? Yeah. And so they were using this as, as an immunosuppressant and as, you know, as, you know, actual doctors prescribing this as an immune, uh, immune, uh, suppressant. And they actually had to discontinue using it as an immune suppressant because it, it, the rates of cancer went up so much in those patients that they they had to discontinue it. This shit is toxic. It's absolutely oh, it's toxic. crazy. And, this yeah. I will eat that shit, and I swear, like, so I, where I work, uh, they for some reason provide lunch. It's great, you mm -hmm. know, super blessed to have that. But I can't eat it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I I will. Like, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'll, you know, I'm not like a hundred percent just eat meat. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have one of those things where I'm like, get really sick if I don't. But, mm -hmm. but that said, I don't feel good when I eat yeah. that food. And I asked, uh, the lady, the, the people who cook it, what it was cooked in, it's all canola oil. Yeah. I noticed because, um, I, I was eating so much more when I was at the office. Like mm -hmm. I would eat like a salmon and then like something else. And then, and it was all meat, right? It was yeah. all meat, but it was all cooked in canola oil. And it was just like insatiable. Like I just kept wanting to eat. And then it was like, I, I, I almost felt like, um, when I eat like that, I feel kind of like when you have too much caffeine, you're a little bit like weird and yeah. wiry. And it's cause I don't, you know, I don't have, I'm not like cooking in canola oil at home. When I'm at home, I'm just cooking in bacon and like bacon, eggs and beef pretty much. And so it's like when I have that contrast, I'm like, this is a shit show, yeah. you know, and you would never know if you're eating it all the time, which I have been, which everybody does because it's in everything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great. I, I think uh, when I listened to Paul Zandino, he was talking about how um, it's like in the last hundred years that it was in our diets, it's like directly correlated to heart disease and also like obesity dramatically increasing. Mm. And you know, it, it's something to the equivalent of having like two teaspoons of it, I think, or maybe it was two tablespoons is the equivalent of having like the oil from like 74, like years of corn, basically right. condensed into one, which is like 74 glasses of water in a day is like a lot. <laughs> like, you know, that's too much. Like mm -hmm. it is so 74 of anything yeah. is terrible. 
and then just there's a lot of stuff in corn that's just not good for you you know and people yeah. well you know the dosage that we do okay well well 74 ears of corn is gonna ramp that up pretty quickly and yeah. um you know and, and the way that they make this oil is uh really toxic i mean I, just watch watch a video on how they make this stuff it's horrible and it's, yeah. it's rancid and and just uh really nasty they have to use hexane to try and draw out some of the the, the the rancid chemicals that are produced because of it and and hexane itself is a known carcinogen in humans it's a known toxin it's very 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 poisonous and um you know <laughs> can you get all the hexane out of there not likely and yeah. you know then they use bleach to like change the color because it's just such a like a putrid color and they, like so you're gonna get all the bleach out of there not likely and um you know and then we, people are just you know mainlining this shit, and there's a whole bunch of different fats that you know aren't necessary i mean some of them are fine but you know there's a whole bunch of different different ones and that um they get in there not all of them are good for you and you have a massive mm -hmm. Uh, disparity in your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio as well uh, and that just in and of itself can uh, kick off heart disease if you if you don't have enough omega-3s and if your omega-6 level is too high they, it's the same enzymes that process omega-6 and omega-3 and so if you have too much omega-6 it doesn't matter how much omega-3 that you have because it would get, just get completely drowned out and they'll use up all the the enzymes you won't even be able to process any of the omega threes, and it's it's necessary. It's necessary to life. It's omega threes and omega sixes um, are very. I mean, you need omega six, but in a very limited amount. And past that, it gets very uh, pro inflammatory. Yeah, yeah, and this reminds me of kind of something I heard you say actually in another video where you're talking about fiber, and uh, to that point of like the the shit that's in you know, seed oils. I think that you said that, what was it? Um, you'll know so sawdust mm. or something like that is like sometimes in fiber when they put it in foods. Um, yeah. So they, they do put fiber in, in, uh, different foods. So they, uh, there's, there's a number of different foods. So they, they do it just, just to up the fiber content, right? They do what? They uh, add, add sawdust. Right. So like literal sawdust. Yeah. Yeah. Like actual sawdust. So they'll, they'll, add, it, they'll add it to uh, foods to increase the amount of fiber, right? Because fiber is now deemed an essential nutrient. It's also a, a marketing tool. Right? right. And so, so they will, um, uh, just add that in it and just say, oh, this has this much fiber. This has this much fiber, uh, and it may it may have natural fiber, but a lot of a lot of processed foods and things like that, they take the fiber out because they're freezing it and processing it and doing those sorts of things. And you know, maybe it doesn't have um, uh, you know fiber doesn't doesn't freeze very well apparently, so it does it just sort of gets a, a bad texture. And um, but yeah, so if they're gonna if they're gonna add uh, fiber into things, I mean they'll they'll add they'll add this stuff into you know, just random things, um, you know, maybe as a thickener, but also to increase the fiber content and yeah, sawdust, you know what I mean? That's, that's what, that's what fiber is cellulose, right? Like we can't maybe, I mean, I'm assuming humans can't process sawdust unless no. I'm totally missing the mark. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so like, isn't that technically like, couldn't you kind of call that like, if you were to rewrite the books illegal? In a sense, like, I mean, truly, I mean, all of this is like illegal, right? But like, how is that, that there is that as a supplement to make it seem like there's more fiber, it's sawdust in food? Um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, they, they add all sorts of things. I mean, you, you add in uh, iron filings into Kellogg's cornflakes to make the iron content higher, but that doesn't mean that it's bioavailable. It doesn't mean that it's good for you. It just, it's just yeah. a, a marketing ploy, you know, it says this has more iron. This is, this is good for you. Um, and people think that fiber is good for you. It's not, but you know, they think that. And so, you know, you increase the, you, know, you put that in as, as increasing the fiber content, but no, you can't, you can't use it. You can't use cell, cellulose at all. No vertebrate animal can break down cellulose. Um, it's actually in herb or herbivorous animals that eat fiber. It's the bacteria in their gut that's specially cultivated yeah. that, that eats the fiber and that produces, um, that produces uh, short chain fatty acids, which are 100% saturated, and that's what they absorb. And so, you know, a gorilla that just eats green leaves, they get about 70% of their calories from saturated fat because they they eat fiber, but it 
you know, what they actually absorb is, is the fat and then the bacteria break down or die and then they break that down and absorb that as protein. So they're, they're eating leaves, but they're absorbing fat and protein. And that's what animals need is fat and protein, uh, by and large. And we don't have that ability anymore. We lost that ability millions of years ago. You know, we have a, an appendix, it's, just this, it's a vestigial cecum, cecum in, in, uh, other herbivorous primates, uh, is very long. It's very elongated. And, uh, that's where fiber, you know, goes into and packs in and, and, uh, breaks down slowly into short chain fatty acids. So we lost that ability millions of years ago because we haven't used it in millions of years. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe the appendix does something else, but it doesn't do that anyway. And so we don't have the ability to break down fiber. We don't, you know, uh, we don't get anything from fiber, but we're told that you need it somehow. So it's called an essential nutrient, meaning that if you don't have it, yeah. you'll die. That's what essential nutrient means. You know, yeah. And it's like, where, why, what's the deal with that? Was that like a, now obviously it's a marketing ploy. Like, I just feel like every time I'm making video, talking video, mm. I, I'm like a broken record and I'm always saying that, but it's literally that it's like mm. everything that we've been told about food, it seems is something that's been taught to us that, you know, we've been told and sold essentially. Yeah. Right. And like, you know, fiber, what's the story there, right? Was it like one dude who was like, I'm going to make everybody have it seem, you know, like the word natural, right? When they put that on foods and it's like, this mm. is all natural. That doesn't mean anything, yeah. right? Like, is it kind of like that? Yeah. And then it sounded more appealing or was it just more voluminous or what? Yeah. Well, I mean, arsenic's natural, right? So, I mean, that, that natural doesn't, doesn't help. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. um, well, the fiber thing, I mean, the fiber thing started back in, in the eighties with, um, you know, when we first started reducing the amount of fat that we ate and, uh, and all of a sudden people started getting a lot more fat. They said, Oh, fat busters got to trim the fat, cut the fat. And that, that's what everyone thought. You are what you eat. You eat fat. You'll get fat. That was that argument. Uh, well, I'm not a broccoli, so I don't see why I should eat a broccoli either. You know, I guess mm -hmm. by that logic. Right. But I am an animal. So maybe I should eat other, other animals. Right. Uh, because you are what you eat. And so, uh, obviously that's, that's just silly in its face, but but that was the argument was that if you eat fat, you're going to get fat, which is not true. Um, and we were cutting fat and we were reducing fat and people were getting more overweight and the obesity rate started climbing up steadily since then. And, um, and so people argued back in the eighties that, well, if you, if you eat more fiber, that's going to fill up your stomach and it's going to hit your stretch receptors, release leptin, and you'll, you'll be satiated. You'll, you'll trick your body into thinking that it's full, but you won't actually get much nutrition out of it and you won't get many calories out of it. So that was, that was an argument to say, Hey, you should eat things that don't actually provide nourishment. And somehow that's mm -hmm. a benefit. Um, you know, maybe, maybe if you're trying to, you know, cheat fat, you know, a weight loss or something like that, maybe it actually doesn't work. It actually goes the opposite direction, but, um, but you can't argue that that's our natural evolved diet to eat things that we don't get nutrition from. That doesn't make any sense, but that's what the argument that they're making now. Uh, you know, they've never argued that humans were herbivores. Um, we, people always understood that humans were carnivores, apex predators, top of the food chain, uh, apex predators don't graze and they don't eat a bunch of cabbage. You know, they, they eat meat, they eat the other animals. Uh, around them and it made all other animals. That's what an apex predator is. It can hunt anything it wants. And yeah. now they're saying, no, 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 we actually evolved on this. So this is actually what we have to do. Well, that doesn't make sense. You wouldn't, you wouldn't eat things that you can't get nutrition from. You don't eat things in order to stop your body from getting nutrients. The, what you're designed to eat is what you should eat is what, what's going to be most bioavailable to you. What you're going to have the biomechanics to break down and absorb. That's what you're biologically meant to eat. And fiber is one of these things. Fiber cannot be broken down by us, but they said, well, if you eat it, it will block absorption of other things. So that's good. You won't absorb as many calories or nutrients. It doesn't have many calories or nutrients in it anyway. Vegetables are very devoid of calories and nutrients because we can't access them. You may have a whole bunch of spinach and you know, and spinach may have a whole bunch of iron and calcium and things like that, but you, we don't actually absorb it very well. And there've been studies in humans looking at that. And they actually, the calcium levels, serum calcium levels go down when people eat 
uh, more spinach, you know, so it's like, well, that doesn't help. Yeah. Um, you know, have a lot of oxalates as well that can actually bind to calcium and, and strip that out of your body as well. So even though, though it has calcium, it, you lose more calcium than you get. And there was a, there's this idea that, you know, of, of, I don't know if you heard about this, the, the celery diet where, um, like it was back in the sort of eighties and nineties where people said basically celery takes more energy to process and digest and move through your system than you'll yeah. get from it. So you can just eat as much celery as you want. You can just pig out on celery, just eat all the celery, all eat all this celery. And, uh, and it doesn't matter. You know, you'll actually lose weight. You'll lose, uh, you'll, you'll be burning calories just by eating celery. And so people just, hey, just eat as much celery as you want. It's like, it was just funny, you know, that, that people would, would go to those lengths, but, um, but that was the argument. And that was the argument of why you, you should eat fiber, uh, was, was because it doesn't provide nutrition. It doesn't provide any benefit and it blocks out the absorption of other things, but it makes you think you're full. And of course your body's much more sophisticated than that. You have receptors in your stomach that track directly to your brain through the vagus nerve that track protein and fat and nutrients, not just calories. Our, our body's looking for nutrients, not looking for calories. Calories is, is a human concept that, you know, well, we, yeah, no, go, go ahead with the calories. Go ahead with the calories. I was going to second that yes yeah and so you know this is just something you know we, we burn this in a you know in a lab and we see how much heat comes off and that's yeah. how many calories is in fat that's how many calories are in uh protein and carbohydrates mm -hmm. and things like that that is not how your body uses these things it's not one-to-one -one. these are these are complex organic molecules that have complex chemical reactions in your body and you know to say that you know glycine it has the same, all that matters is, is the amount of calories and you have a specific amount of calories of glycine that's going to react exactly the same as, as stearic acid in your body. I mean, you're fooling yourself. These are extremely complex and very different molecules. So that's strange on its face that people would argue that, but they do. And they also said that, well, you should use it for your bowel motion, motions as well, because um, everyone's getting constipated. Well, it's actually fat that drives your digestion. It keeps everything soft and moving is, is the excess fat your body can't absorb. And so when we stopped eating fat, everyone started eating less and less fat. People started getting very constipated. And uh, I mean, I remember this as a kid, people were talking about this, everyone was getting constipated, constipated. And the doctors are like, oh, you should eat more fiber. And that, and that bolts yep. things up and that moves things through faster. I, re I remember that be when that was being suggested and recommended and you know, when I was so like what my mom lived by and mm. like everybody, my aunts, everybody, that's what, what it was, mm. is like eat fiber, eat fiber, eat fiber. Cause you're constipated or like if you are constipated, but it's just more, it's waste, yeah. right? It just, turns, it. we can't process it. It's just, it. it literally is waste. Yeah. yeah you, you can't use it. You can't process it. It has to go out. You know, it's funny that, uh, you know, they vilified meat so much, especially like in the eighties. I remember even like on Beverly Hills cop, you know, that movie like with, with, uh, um, uh, Oh, it's been a minute. I know it. I've seen Murphy, it. Yeah. Was it the Eddie Murphy? God, why can't I remember? Yeah, that? I love yeah. Eddie Murphy. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so it was Beverly Hills Cop, and I remember, you know, like one of the characters like walks in, and just it's just this offhand thing. You know, this is sort of the these subliminal plugs that that Hollywood does. But it said this guy was just like, oh my god, did you know that by the time you're thirty, you have ten pounds of undigested meat in your colon? Like, oh my god, and it's just this offhand remark is in a, in a random spot in a movie and no one ever talked about it again, but it gets in people's head. And then now people say, oh, you can't digest it, just rots in your colon. Okay, where'd you get that from? What's your, what's your paper that you cited? Beverly Hills Cop? You know, because that's literally where that came from. And then people just started saying, oh my God, did you know this? Like, it's a movie, all right? Like, it doesn't, yeah. It's not real, do you, you know? Do you think it was planted? Do you think it was like put there in the script, like paid like as an advertisement in a sense? Or like, I don't know, right? I wouldn't I'm doubt sure. it. Sure, but you know, but a lot of these, a lot of these things are, or just, you know, someone in, in the making the movie has their own personal biases. Had their own belief, and yeah. And I mean, just says that, or it might've been just something funny that they'd heard and they wanted to put in the movie. Uh, but either way, it's not true. You know, I mean, like, I remember even thinking at the time, I was just like, how would that work? 
You know, the, our, our intestine is a tube. It goes one direction. You know, it can't just sit there for 10 years or else you'll get, a, you'll, right. you'll get obstructed. You'll die. And I mean, I was, I was a child and I, and I was uh, able to recognize that. So, you know, and, and of course that's true. If you can't digest it, it has to come out. It comes out as waste. It comes out in your feces and that that's what doesn't get digested. It comes out in your feces. So it wouldn't just sit there for 10 years. It wouldn't sit there for any amount of time. It would come out of you. And that's what fiber does. Fiber cannot be digested at all. It cannot be broken down at all. And so it has to come out. And that's actually said, oh, this is good for you. This is a bulking agent. This makes things move through. But meat will sit there and rot for 10 years. Which one, which one is it? You know, if you, if you can't break it down, you can't absorb it. Does it come out and act as a bulking agent and help you move things through your colon? Or... Uh, does it just sit there and rot for decades? You know, I mean, you, you yeah. can't have it both ways, you know, so it's wild. Yeah. So if, if that were the case that we didn't, didn't break down and absorb meat, it would get released. Right. And, and we would just see it. You just see a bunch of raw meat, you know, coming, coming out the back end, but you know, you don't, see yeah. that. you know, you see a bunch of fiber though. So the five, so it's the same story. Basically some company wanted the, the people that wanted to probably make money off of vegetables because they they probably have a higher margin, right? To sell them, you know, would be like, okay, yeah, it's like, let's entice people to want to eat vegetables. One, because they're more easily accessible maybe, but also the profit margin is large and we can just sell that. And then let's add a nice marketing flair to it by adding in fiber. It's a made up word, right? Like it's a totally made up thing. I mean, essentially kind of like the calories, like you were talking about. I mean, it's all, it's all like a human perception, just like everything is, but like, it's really very clear when we're talking about nutrition because fiber is like a construct, right? It's, um, and so is calories. It's like, like one calorie, like that doesn't, I think calories matter, but when I eat just meat, like mm -hmm. I can eat a lot and still come out pretty lean mm -hmm. and like, I'm looking better than I did way before. Like, so one of the reasons I got into carnivore, probably the reason one of my best friends, he actually started doing it. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And I was starting to make YouTube videos. So I was like, Oh, let's, uh, like think about this and see what it's like. This was a while ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wasn't really serious about YouTube. So I just was like, okay, maybe I'll try it for a month and just see, tried it for a month. I had my entire life up until that point, always had an eating disorder mm -hmm. forever because I was never full. Like mm -hmm. I just like, couldn't <laughs> be full, you know, yeah. and it was so annoying, but you know, you're told to eat salads and like all these things and measure calories. And I had nutritionists and I had, I was weightlifting and all these things. And, um, I lost like 10 pounds in that month and I was never hungry and I was trail running and I was like, just kicking ass yeah. and like, I looked good and I felt good. And, um, you know, back in that time too, I lived in uh, Colorado at that time and weed was legal there at that time. So when I was there, I could smoke it and that was cool. And like, I didn't get like the crazy sugar, like des desperation thing, mm. right? Like that you have to get the munchies that everybody gets. Yeah. Um, and, and it was like fascinating cause I only did it for a month and I was like, Whoa, what's going on here? And so that's when I kind of realized all this like stuff that all these, all these skeletons in the closet with mm. fiber, with fat, with cholesterol, with all that kind of stuff. Um, and like how we've kind of just been sold this, this story that's all generated in like base and profit. Um, and I, and I, and I find, I, I don't, I wanted to hear your opinion on this too. It's kind of off topic, but I find the same thing with the alcohol industry. Um, I think that to each his own, if people want to drink, that's awesome. If they have a good relationship, that's great. Like, I don't think the alcohol should be legalized or anything like that. Right. But I do think that the programming behind the benefits that come with alcohol is mm. completely inflated, completely mm. inflated. Like I stopped drinking when I was 25, 26. And this is relevant, I guess, to carnivore because you can't drink when you're on carnivore or animal based. Right. But like when I stopped drinking my entire world, like I thought it was going to suck. I thought socially things were going to suck and actually everything like totally blossomed in so mm. many different ways. And I was just a weakened drinker. Like, you know, I, that yeah. was it. And, um, I started to realize like there was just this language around alcohol that was just like so lame. Like it just like mm. around not drinking, I should say, it's just like, it was only for people who were like really a shit show or that decided to stop drinking or something was wrong with them. Or, yeah. you know, you must have gone to AA or you must have really screwed up or like, I don't know, you're fragile in a sense. I don't know mm. how to put it, but like, 
I realized like it's actually just this total life hack to mm-hmm. stop drinking. Like my my income like quadrupled. <laughs> my I looked better. Yeah. I like like I lost like twenty pounds with no effort like at all. Um, I everything just got better. I don't know. And so I started looking at advertising and I was like, what in the, what? Like, and I saw it ruin so many people's lives. Very similar to like, if we're going to be relating this to like sugar, right. Or fiber cholesterol, right. Like it's all these stories that you see. It's just like destroying people when it really doesn't need to. And if you at least know what's actually going on, like, or have like, then you have options, I guess. Like, you know, I'm not perfect with carnivore. I, I won't say that I eat just 100% meat. I know you advocate for that. I don't want to hear that too. But like, I, um, I don't have any like reactions to sugar and I just love it. So I'll have some here and there, Yeah. <laughs> you know, but like if I'm, if I, I should just do a hundred percent, but like, I don't know. I think that, uh, to have the information to know about sugar. Like I know it causes all these problems. I know it causes dementia and Alzheimer's and Mm. we know that now and heart disease, we're figuring all this stuff out. So it's like, at least I can understand like, like in the same way that we know about cigarettes now. Okay. You smoke this probably not great. Like do what you got to do if you're going to do it here and there, but no, that's not setting you up for success. Right. Mm. That's, that's kind of how I see a lot of these things now. It's like, let's just have the truth. Right. I don't care what's, what's what's right or what's wrong it's just like what's the truth i guess so yeah. anyways that's that's kind of how i see all, a lot of this these days well i you know, i agree and you know i i don't i don't want i don't i'm i'm very libertarian in that where I, I think i don't think we should criminalize these things um yeah. but i think that people should know about them and you should know that alcohol is bad for you and sugar is bad for you and these things and then you can make your own decision and that and that's right. what i try to do with my channel that's what i've tr- tried to do with my channel is to just educate people and say, Hey, look, there's, there's another side of this story. And yes, these guys are saying that there's this study that shows this other thing, but there are a lot of other studies that show the exact damn opposite. And in practice, you're finding the exact damn opposite. And so, you know, I just want people to know that. And so that they can make their decision. I don't, I don't care if people smoke or want to drink or or do drugs. I really don't. I think if, you know, that is your choice as, as an individual, as an adult, I think that things should be age restricted, certainly. Um, but I also think that, you know, sugar should probably be age restricted and, and not just giving out to kids, um, you know, uh, uh, just like crazy because that, you know, that, that really affects their brains and their development. And it's, it's very bad for them. You know, in the 1800s, late 1800s, like 1890s, the average American was eating around like two to four pounds of sugar a, a year, right? Now it's over 150 pounds of sugar a year. Right. It's in everything and it is very addictive. Fructose is uh, very addictive. Um, It goes, it gives a dopamine response to the dopamine response to the addiction centers of your brain, just like cocaine, heroin and meth. And there are MRI studies looking at those areas of your brain. And it shows that that sugar fructose kills the same areas of your brain as meth to the same extent as meth. Okay, so that's crazy to me that that we don't know that and that this we were just shoveling this onto kids especially because it fructose goes to your liver and is actually processed and broken down to the same byproducts uh, uh, that ethanol is right so you get the same damage to your liver that you you get from those breakdown products of fructose and ethanol right gram for gram so you get fatty liver disease cirrhosis diabetes, um, you know, implicated in heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's now. So this is, this is not good. And it's not good to be giving this to kids. Certainly not in the, the amounts that we're giving them, you know, a bit of fruit every now and then fine, yeah. you know, like a, a, a piece of birthday cake, fine. But like sugar every single day is not fine. You know, this is what we talk about. Yeah. Oh, they get it. Oh, they got a sugar high. He's got a sugar high. Something like that. We joke about that, but that, that is what it is. It is a drug and they are getting high. They're getting a dopamine response and it's affecting their body. And people think that a drug is only as bad for your body as, as, uh, how high it makes you. And so, well, obviously it can't be that bad. It's just sugar. Well, no, it's, it's actually damaging your body to a similar extent as alcohol. And now, now we're getting, you know, children under 10 that have metabolic syndrome and fatty liver disease and getting diabetes and things like that. I remember that was, you know, when I was a kid in the nineties, they, uh, they actually came out and, and were shocked. They had to rename the, the, what we, what we called these different diseases because it wasn't called type two diabetes back then. It was called adult onset diabetes. 
Yeah. It's because it only sort of happened in, you know, middle age to, to late, late age adults, usually alcoholics. There's a good reason for that. And now we were seeing kids like, you know, 10 year olds in the nineties getting adult onset diabetes. And I, I remember like the people going like, well, what, what is this? You know, the, but this is, but it's not an adult. How can a kid get adult onset diabetes? We've never seen this in kids. It's only been in adults. And he's also got fatty liver disease. But only alcoholics get fatty liver disease. How can how can these kids never drank alcohol? How can you get fatty liver disease if you never get if it's if it's only from alcohol? Fermented so, sugar. It is, yeah, exactly. And so now we know that, and we have we have actual uh, studies out of UCSF. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Lustig, Professor Lustig, he's a professor emeritus of medicine there, and he uh, actually showed causation. He had, had studies in humans in in a bunch of kids that actually satisfied the Bradford Hill criteria for causation. So it actually shows causation uh, between fructose and metabolic syndrome and fatty liver disease. And we knew this biochemically. They, the UCSF biochemistry department showed in 2009 that, 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 that this goes down and is broken down. Fructose is broken down into the same byproducts as alcohol. So we've known that mechanistically. Now we have you know, proof in clinical trials uh, in humans showing causation. So, you know, this is, um, this is a major, major drug. And, yeah. you know, so instead of investigating this and thinking, okay, what did we change? What did we do? What could have been affecting this kid? And, and to precipitate this, they just said, you know, it was probably happening all the time. We just didn't notice. That was the argument. It was such a lazy argument, you know? And so instead of actually thinking for one minute and trying to look into this, they just changed the name. They said, like, well, it's probably happening all the time, so it's not really uh, accurate to call it adult onset diabetes. So we'll call it type two diabetes, type one and type two, because it used to be juvenile and adult, and now it's type one and type two. And uh, and then instead of you know, uh, you know, and then they just said, okay, well now it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so oh, it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Hmm, this is strange. We don't we don't really know what it's coming. Yes, we do. It comes from fructose. It's fructose fatty liver disease. It's not. It's not non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because it's broken down in the same products. I mean, you know, I, I learned that in, in uh, my biochemistry module in medical school. I mean, I actually took proper biochemistry, but you know, in medical school we went through uh, some of the biochemistry of, of these things, and, and you know, that was in two thousand nine, and uh, and fructose. Then we were taught in medical school uh, is is metabolized into fatty droplets in your liver. And, and turns into fat droplets in, in your liver. I mean, that, that's right. it's in biochemistry textbooks, right? So, so with, so like that, it's an interesting thing because like you, well, you, I think you've said you do lift weights, but not really that much. You like work out. I don't always have but time, like but you, yeah, I like to, yeah. You, you like to, yeah. But so it's like, you, you were, you know, you played rugby, very, very high level pro for years. So you've gotten this experience of like how to lift, what to do, what to eat. You've probably had an entirely different understanding then mm -hmm. than you do now maybe but um i know when i was learning a while ago a long time ago there was like a you know constant thing of like having a sugar pump after you lift mm -hmm. like a quick pixie stick or something like that and it helps um i think that's probably total crap right but mm -hmm. like i would be curious to see to fuel workouts this is a thing that i've been wanting to figure out myself is like i imagine that if one goes 100 percent carnivore which I have done many mm. times and done it for months. You can have that fuel mm. to fuel yourself because you're adapting to using fat as energy. Mm -hmm. um, I don't imagine you're going to be as puffy big for like men that want to be big. Mm -hmm. Like they want to build size unless they just eat a ton. One of my best friends, he eats um, carnivore and has found that rice works for him, mm -hmm. but it's not carnivore. So, right, like he adds on that for like the extra calories, but also the, the, to build the muscle. What do you say, I guess, for people like that who are trying to, let's say, train for a marathon or train to build muscle and they want to be bigger, um, you know, and pack on some weight? I think I think the best thing you can do is is pure carnivore. You'll put on lean muscle mass and you, you'll put it on a lot more easily because your biochemistry will be working in such a way that, that your body can mobilize its energy and utilize its energy and protein and fats in, uh, in a, in a, in a more biologically appropriate way. Um, 
I don't think that that it's as good of an idea to use carbohydrates. First of all, you don't need to use carbohydrates. Your body makes carbohydrates, blood sugar, glycogen, and ketones. And and like you say, you know, after a certain period of time, usually only you know, uh, you know, one to three weeks. For me, it was just right away. I felt better right away. Uh, oh. My energy levels just felt much better. Some people can take up to three weeks to get fully they call it fat adapted or keto adapted. But after that, you know, your, your body, you are, you will have better energy because you're going to make all the blood sugar and glycogen and ketones that you need for what you're doing. And you'll produce it at the rate that you need it. Um, I mean, everyone has a limit, but you know, you, it's very, you'll be very hard pressed to find that limit and your body will continually keep replenishing your glycogen and your, and your energy stores from your fat because you can actually access your fat. Whereas when you eat carbohydrates, your insulin goes up, insulin forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells. So it blocks different processes like proteolysis and lipolysis. So it locks down your fat cells. And so you may have all this energy in your fat, but you actually can't access it. And that's why it's, it's more difficult to lose fat. Um, and if you're eating a bunch of carbohydrates, it's not, it's not impossible. We've all done it, but it's, it's not as easy and, uh, it is, it is very easy on a carnivore diet. Um, and so, you know, especially for marathon runners, uh, any sort of endurance athletes you are going to be much better off because you can just keep going and going and going. Whereas if you're eating carbohydrates, you have to, you know, carbo load and you have to pack in a bunch of glycogen in your liver, but that has a limit because you can't replenish it. Right. And so eventually you're going to run out of that after an hour or two of really strenuous exercise, you'll run out of your body's glycogen stores and you'll hit the wall. And that's what people say. Oh, you hit the wall and you crash and you, and you feel horrible. Most people stop there, but then some certain marathon runner, well then and that's why you sort of refeed and eat a bunch of sugary garbage uh, yeah. or historically before they had all these products available to them, they would hit the wall and they would say, but if you keep pushing, you keep pushing, you keep pushing. Eventually, you'll break through the wall and you'll get your second wind and your runner's high and you'll just feel amazing and you can just keep going and going and going and going. Well, I live in my runner's high. I'm always in my second wind because biochemically, I always have access to my fat stores and that's what they're doing. They run out of their glycogen, they run out of their energy stores, but they can't access their fat because their, their insulin is too high. And it usually takes about 24 hours, maybe sometimes more for that to come down and their body starts producing, uh, you know, blood sugar and ketones uh, to a significant degree. But if you push, 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 you can you can break through that and you can start mobilizing energy again or you just die, you know? And so I'm always in that state. I'm always producing energy so I can just go and go and go. I never hit the wall. And so I can work out yeah. hours and hours and hours and I feel great while I'm doing it. As far as muscle building is concerned, um, I don't think it's, it's a great idea. You know, you can get puffy looking, but that doesn't mean that your muscles are bigger. It doesn't mean that you are stronger. It just means you're putting on weight. And that. And as an athlete, that's a bad idea because your strength to weight ratio means how explosive you are, how fast you are, how, uh, you know, how, what your performance is going to be. If, if your strength is X, but, you know, you've packed on an extra 20 pounds, you're going to be slower than if you hadn't, right? Because your, your strength is the same. Now, maybe you're, you're increasing your strength and your muscles are hypertrophying, but you know you, you have to offset that with how much weight you're gaining, right? And so if you're not if you're gaining anything except lean muscle mass, it's it's wasted weight. And so when you're eating carbohydrates, you pack on a more a lot more glycogen in your body. Glycogen molecules attract two water molecules uh, with each glycogen molecule, and so you'll have puffy, water filled muscles, right? And that can add on water weight, which you don't need, you don't want. That's just slowing you down. That's just an anchor behind you, right? And also it, it deposits intramuscular fat. And we see this on MRI all the time. You know, any, any doctor, anyone who's seen MRIs on people or, or other sorts of such scans, you can actually see a lot of people have intramuscular fat. They have intramuscular depositions of fat. Why do we feed cows and sheep grain it's to produce that intramuscular fat and get that marbling and deposit more fat in general and make them fatter bulk them up and so that same biochemical process is happening to you and i and everyone when we eat carbohydrates we can't we're not really processing this stuff in uh in a normal way it's when you get high blood sugar, this is actually quite damaging to our body. This is what kills diabetics. You get chronically high blood sugar. 
And so we we respond by jacking up your insulin. You're just stuffing this energy in any any little hole that we can tuck it into. And one of those one of those is, is in your muscles. And so you get intramuscular fat. And um, you know, and, and anyone who says they don't just needs to look at an MRI the, of an average person in America, and you'll see the intramuscular fat. And you understand this process uh, just conceptually from the fact that this is how this is how we get intramuscular fat in animals that, uh, and livestock is by doing exactly that. And so what if, what if somebody likes the way that they look with the, you know, yeah, the well, bigger, they can, you know, but it, it, it depends on your goals. You know, if they, if they want to look puffy, then fine, you know, do that, you know, and you, do they have like, do they have like raw to stick, like to be healthy, I guess, mm -hmm. the best way they can, like raw milk, you know what I mean? Like, cause yeah. there's some people that have asked me specifically, they built, they body build and they're like, I don't, you know, I'm trying to, keep my size but also i'm not trying to be pounding protein shakes all the time because those are no good well you yeah. know and all well, that yeah, they're, they're not good but but i mean think of it this way you know a lot of a lot of bodybuilders they go into this this state of they're in their build phase and their bulking phase and then they go in their cutting phase and, and some of these guys you know lose like 80 pounds uh you know and then they cut down that, yeah. that shredded lean yeah. look right yeah. well if you were just eating meat the whole time you'd just be lean that whole time and you, oh, I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? So you're saying, yeah, like they're, they were trying to get to that size and you're right. Cause they're trying to build. And then mm -hmm. when they cut, the ideal is that they're chiseled and yeah, like they're bigger, but muscles, they're, but they're cutting fat, right? They're cutting fat and they're cutting yeah. water weight. So they're yeah. uh, of the opinion that by eating carbs, they're going to get more muscle. That's not the case. Right. They're getting more water right. weight and fat. And then they just have to lose that fat. So that's actually holding them back that I think. And I think that just biochemically, they're not going to be able to get as, as good of workouts. They're not going to recover as well. When you don't eat carbohydrates, you don't eat grains, you don't eat plants in general. Like you won't get sore at all. And so, yeah. you know, yeah. And so, and so like, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to be sore and aching? And you're not going to get the recovery that you would otherwise. And you're not going to be able to work out as much as you would otherwise. I can work out way more without carbs and I recover much quicker so I can do more workouts during the week if I have time to. And so I get much, much, much better results. I'm six foot three. I'm a, I'm a big guy. I'm like sort of like 240 pounds. And I've been bigger than that when I was, you know, when I was playing and, and, um, or even when I'm not playing, usually in the off season, uh, I usually get bigger than that. But, you know, I'm, able to put on quite a lot of weight, quite a lot of lean muscle mass very easily. If I'm, if I'm able to consistently go to the gym, you know, I can put on a couple pounds of muscle a week, actually more than that. I, I was looking at this, I was looking at the scale at one point and this is when I was sort of coming up. I was, you know, just sort of hadn't been working out in a while. And so I, I trimmed down a bit and I was still muscular and lean, but I wasn't uh, as, 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 uh, as muscular. And so I started getting back into the gym more. And I noticed that every single time I stepped on the scale, I was like a pound or so more. I weighed a pound or so more. Like every time I went to the gym, I was just another pound, another pound, another pound. But I was the wow. same body fat percentage. So I'm, I'm stacking on like a ridiculous amount of weight. It, when when COVID ended and the gyms finally opened up, I, I had leaned down. I was probably around 210, 215. Yeah, I was probably 210. And um, you know, very lean and muscular, but I was I was not as big as I wanted to be. And I was really annoyed that I wasn't able to, to work out. And so I went to the gym and I was just like, right, I'm back on my, my old professional lifting schedule. I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be hitting the weights and doing this in, in a regular fashion. And I just made it a point to go at least, you know, four to even six times a week. And in five weeks, I put on 25 pounds of, of lean muscle, you know, that's wild. I mean, yeah. I don't doubt it. Cause I had a similar, similar experience. I could, I could, I, I think you're, it's a matter of waiting through that time while you adapt mm -hmm. to make sure that your body can actually, you know, we're all trying to run and do these sprints and all these things. The first week of doing carnivore, right? Mm -hmm. Like second week, maybe like you said, it might take three weeks for some people, mm -hmm. depending on how bad your diet was before, or like mm -hmm. how much you're used to eating crap or if you're still snacking here and there, you know, like yeah. all that. So, um, okay. And I don't, I don't want to keep you too. I, I think we probably should hop off cause I've already kept you for an hour and 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, but honestly we went through so much. I mean, I think we covered like a lot of the things that I wanted to go through. Ultimately, I think you're, I was going to ask you your take on sugar. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're, you're already answered that it's bad. Like don't I have don't, that. I basically. don't think it's good. It causes, yeah. I think, I think it's yeah. one of the worst. 
one of the worst things. Yeah, except, sugar. Yeah, and it seems like it causes things. like it causes like everything, like inflammation. I think they're finding Alzheimer's and dementia and all that kind yeah. of stuff is linked to it. Everything. So basically, if we're trying to prevent any disease or like we're trying to improve our life in any way possible, whether that's emotionally with anxiety, with depression, with our body weight, our body composition, etc. Mm. One first thing would be to remove sugar, you would mm. think, in all formats, in mm. every way, and start with just red meat mm. and maybe some bacon and eggs. Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, I, you know, my, I think that in the hierarchy of things you get rid of, I think you know, alcohol and sugar would be number one on the list. And I consider For those sure. things the same thing, you know, because sugar is, is treated by your body very similarly to alcohol and then get rid of all carbohydrates. And, uh, and then you start sort of going down, like get rid of nightshades, get rid of, you know, high oxalate containing foods and beans and seeds and all those sorts of things that generally have a higher concentration of, of defense chemicals and plants used to def protect themselves and protect um, their offspring, which are what seeds are. And this is why you'll generally see a higher concentration of toxins in seeds, nuts, and, and legumes. And, um, you know, even, even ones that we eat, like, you know, like kidney beans, you can, you can, yeah. if you don't cook these things and prepare them right, they can actually put you in the hospital as, as little, in a WHO actually, um, has an article that say as little as five kidney beans, um, you know, not prepared properly can put you in the hospital and has put people in the hospital. So that's, that's something that, you know, people should, should pay attention to and uh, understand. And, um, but yeah, my, my hard rule for myself is, uh, I just eat meat. I eat fatty meat. Fat's very good for you. And I, I think it's as important what not to eat as what to eat. And so my hard rule for myself is no plants, no sugar, or any sweeteners, nothing artificial. And that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well. And so I, I just feel much, much better doing that. And even just getting rid of that last little vestiges of just vegetables made me feel so much better, improved my health so much, improved my athleticism so much that it's, I just have no interest in ever going back. And, you know, I'm not saying that everyone has to do that, but I do that. I choose to do that because I feel so much better. And I encourage people to at least think about it, at least try it, you know, just try it for a month. You know, it's, yeah. it, you will feel a lot better. And if, you know, you want to include other things in your life, you know, you know more power to you. Like, great. But, you know, just check, just see, just see the contrast and see how it makes you feel. And, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, you'll see for yourself, you make your own decisions, but I feel amazing yeah. and I've never felt better. And yeah. I, I don't plan on ever feeling uh, bad again. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's so cool to have these conversations too. Cause it's like, you kind of, you hear all these groups that kind of almost sound like, I hate to say the word, but kind of cult like in a way where mm -hmm. it's like, where this is us and we're us and them kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. Right. And something that I really want to talk about with this, that, uh, you know, I really, care about is like this isn't like that this is like we all are trying to find health and happiness and like this is a huge way to get there and it's free in yeah. fact you'll save money and yeah. and nobody's trying to be like us versus them this is like literally the truth everything you just talked about cholesterol fat fiber is the truth mm -hmm. like that is just it and so like let's just start there so yeah, I really appreciate the time, Dr. Chafee. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Where can everybody find you? Where do they look to find your socials, Instagram, YouTube, all that stuff? Yeah, well, well thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, so I am on Instagram, and that's just Anthony Chafee, MD. I do stuff on Twitter as well, just Anthony underscore Chafee. And then my main channel will be YouTube. Just uh, that's where I get all my put all my videos up. Uh, and that, again, is Anthony Chafee, MD. And then my podcast is just called the plant free MD. And that's uh, where anyone uh, can find, uh, you know, wants to find podcasts, they can, they can find it there. And um, then I have other socials as well, but they're all linked through the other ones. People can find them. Plant free MD. I like yeah. that. It rhymes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Right on. 